Hello, welcome back to the OTB channel. Um, something a little bit different today. Um, something of a, a, a technical subject to cover. Uh, I was glad to see that many of you enjoyed uh, my Arch Linux install on my little laptop last week. Um, but it got me thinking uh, when I was doing the install over SSH, you know, I haven't used SSH for an awful long time. And with there being more desktop users out there, and with Linux desktops being so easy and GUI-based, I wonder if there are people out there who don't actually use SSH or don't actually know a great deal about it. Um, I may be making that assumption completely wrong. Um, but I thought, why not do something on SSH? My phone's dinging, I do apologise. Um, so, I was thinking about how to put this together. And last night I saw um, Chris Titus's uh, video on SSH, where he looks specifically at SCP and SFTB, TP, uh, the file transfer uh, facilities that come bundled with open ssh and i thought well they're great but what about setting everything up at scratch so that you can access your desktop from a remote location what about setting up key-based authentication and securing your ssh server what about local port forwarding and accessing such things as RDP over an SSH tunnel. And uh, also, um, for those who are particularly lazy, uh, and I'm including myself in this, how about setting up an SSH config file that is populated with stanzas that reduce the amount of typing that we've got to do and the remembering of uh, long, complicated commands? So that's what this is going to be about. Um, I'm not a sysadmin. Um, some of this, especially the local port forwarding, is uh, quite difficult to get your head round. But the bottom line is it works. And if you can get your head round the commands, uh, you can accomplish quite a lot. So with that said, let's start off. Hope you enjoy it. So uh, where do we start if we're looking at uh, setting up uh, SSH to actually access um, our Linux box or indeed our Mac box or even our Windows box um, remotely? Well, the first thing you're probably going to need is a, a dynamic DNS host name. The reason being, very few of us as home root users have a, a static IP address provided by our ISP. Um, reason being, it usually costs money. Um, and secondly, it's not really necessary. There's a whole range of services out there that can provide you with dynamic DNS for free. The big one that most people used to use was DIN DNS, which is very good, um, but they no longer offer a free option. However, uh, there are many different uh, uh, companies out there that will offer a free option for home users. And essentially what they do is they map your external IP address to a host name. So just to give you an example, and this isn't mine, um, I know that DIN DNS used to have a whole range of host names that uh, started isageek.org or isageek.com. So I might, for instance, have set up my particular host name as otb.isageek.com. Um, and that would be mapped to my external IP address. So when I wanted to SSH into my box... Um, I would simply type from an external uh, source uh, SSH OTB at otb.isageek.com and it saves remembering your external IP address. Now, DIN DNS no longer offers free clients, but there are a whole range of clients out there. Uh, I mean, just to give you an example, I've, I've pulled up one page here. 
um, afraid.org, which is free, Duck DNS, No IP, which is actually the provider that I use, Secure Point, Dynamic DNS, Entry DNS, Dynu, Dynamic DNS, and so the list goes on. So just do a Google search and pick one that uh, suits your needs. Now, one of the key things that you're going to have to do if you set up a dynamic DNS account is you need to make sure that the host name that's allocated to you is constantly updated with your new IP address because ISPs will change your external IP addresses. Now, you'll find in many routers these days that they have an option to put in a, a dynamic DNS login and they will do the updating for you automatically and refresh at particular intervals. If your router doesn't have that option, it's not a problem because in Linux we have something called DD Client and I've got the Arch Wiki uh, uh, page for dynamic DNS up here and you'll see that the DD client actually supports a whole range of these dynamic DNS services. And you would just install it. it. doesn't have to be Arch. You would install it and set it running, and it would automatically update your uh, host name each time your external IP address uh, actually changed. So that's the first thing. You want a consistent way of being able to access your box when the external IP address changes. Um, as I said, I tend to use uh, no IP these days. It's very simple. You do have to update and log in. I think it's every 28 days, uh, but they do send you uh, emails when the time is nigh and your router should do it anyway or DD client should do it anyway. So you shouldn't have too much of a problem. It's easy to set up. You can set up a free account um takes a couple of minutes and you're done what you need to do next okay well it's all very well having a dynamic host name but if you want to access your computer i'm just going to say computer because it doesn't necessarily have to be a linux box if you want to access your computer remotely over the internet you are going to have to set up port forwarding on your router I'm not going to provide specific instructions for this because every router is different. However, there is um, a useful page here uh, on portforward.com which lists a whole range of different routers. And if yours is there, let's take, uh, I don't know, a Linksys. Um, let's have a look. Linksys go through the advert that unfortunately is going to come up and it will tell you how to access the port forwarding page on a Linksys router and how to set up port forwarding. Okay. So set up your dynamic DNS uh, address Make sure that you set up port forwarding on your router. You've got some reading to do. And to be honest, it's probably better that you do the reading because before you open up your internal network to the outside world, you really need to know what you're doing. Um, and the next thing to say is you need to set up static IP addresses or an address to the box that you want to access. Now, you can do this in various ways. You can use Network Manager to set up a, a static IP address on your computer. Um, this is the internal IP address, the 192.168.1. whatever, or the 10.10. .10. It's the internal network IP. You need to have that as a static address because if you port forward on your router, your router needs to know where it's going to send requests to, which box. So if you open up, for instance, the SSH port on your router, port 22, 
and forward it, you need to forward it to the computer that you want to access. Now, again, most modern uh, routers have a method of doing this. Certainly, I, I, I'm using EE at the moment uh, for my internet service provider, and I'm just using the standard EE Smart Hub, and uh, they have an advanced configuration page where I can simply click a button if I want the same IP address allocated to my computer every time it connects to the router. So, in summary, that, that's the external work that you need to do. Set up a dynamic IP address, set up port forwarding on your router, set up a static IP address on the machine that you want to access. We can now go and talk about setting up SSH itself. So we're all set up um, and I'm just going to show you uh, this over uh, my local network as currently uh, I don't have any ports open on my router as I don't have a great need to access my desktop externally. Nevertheless, SSH, as you saw last week when I did the Arch install, can be useful anyway. So here I am. On my uh, Arch uh, Linux install on my main desktop. And let's say I want to SSH into uh, the Arch installation that I did last week on my laptop. Well, I know that the internal IP address for that is 192.168.1.131. And I know that the user is OTB. So the way that I would do that, I simply type SSH. And if I'm on the standard port number, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a second, I would then specify the port number that I wanted it to go to. Port 22 is the standard port. And as long as you're accessing things on port 22, you don't actually need this bit. But OTB, which is the user, at the IP address. And I click OK. And I'm immediately being prompted for OTB's password. And there you go. I am now into that Arch Linux bo box. Um, I've done nothing with it since uh, um, I uh, installed it last week. So I haven't uh, gone on to configuring it anymore. Nevertheless, here we have SSH set up and I'm accessing the main box. Now, do we always need to put the minus P in? No, we don't. I'm going to exit from SSH, and as I'm still using just the standard port 22, I can miss out that bit and just put OTB at 192.168.1.131, and it will still let me in. However, you may have a reason in terms of security to set OpenSSH's uh, port to something other than 22. And if so, you do need to specify it. Now, typing the password constantly is a nuisance, but there are ways around that that are more secure. And the main way that people use is rather than using a password, you set up um, a public and private key pair and you log in using that public and private key pair. Let me show you how to do this. Okay, so I've uh, exited out of uh, my OTB box and I'm back on uh, my desktop. First thing to do to generate a key is to make sure that you're on your host machine and luckily SSH or OpenSSH includes a utility for generating a key pair. And the, the command you need is simply SSH dash key gen. 
So SSH dash key gen and hit enter. Enter file in which to save the key. It's going to save the key in my .ssh directory in my home directory. You don't have to save it there. You may have a number of different keys generated. You could, for instance, use one that uh, you use for accessing um, your home machines. You could have another one for accessing a VPS. You could have another one for accessing your work computers. But the default is home your home directory, .ssh, and id underscore rsa. Do I need to en enter a passphrase? Well, you can also enter a, a passphrase or a password when your, your keys actually uh, match and speak to each other. I would recommend this if you are accessing your box over the internet. Internally, I'm not going to bother here. So enter the same password again. Okay, all done. And it tells me what my key fingerprint is. So if I go to uh, my home directory and I view hidden files, you'll see that I have a .ssh directory there. And in there, I have a known hosts file and I have two keys, my private key id underscore rsa and my public key id underscore rsa dot pub okay so what i want to do in order to be able to access the arch box from last week using key-based authentication i need to get my public key onto that box luckily ssh has also given us um, a nice little utility in order to do that. So let me just clear the screen again. And the utility I need is ssh dash copy dash id id. So ssh dash copy dash id and then the details of the server that I want to SSH into. So OTB at 192.168.1.131. It's asking for OTB's password. I'm going to enter that now. Right. We've added the key to the remote box. So now if I try logging into the box again, by doing ssh otb at 192.168.1.131 and hit return, I don't need to enter a password. My private key is matched up with the public key that is put on my external box and all is good. Right, yes, this is useful. Of course it's useful because um, it means that I don't have to keep entering passwords, but actually it's a bit more useful than that because for security purposes, it means that I can now disable password authentication, um, which minimizes uh, the opportunity for hackers to get into the box. Um, they no longer just have to guess the password that I was using to get onto the OTB account. Uh, they also have to be able to provide a copy of my private key, which you should keep private. Okay, so you've set up a key-based authentication, which is the first stage of securing your SSH connection, but it's not the only thing that you should be looking at. You should also open up your SSHD config file, which is located in etc uh, forward slash SSH. And you should see that on the screen in front of you now. And I have the cursor currently at the entry that says port 22. Now you'll see that is commented out um, because port 22 is the standard port that SSHD listens on. 
it doesn't have to run on port 22. You could change that port. A lot of people use 2222. Two, two. Um, and the reason that they change the port, uh, well, there's a, there's a saying that goes security by obscurity. Automated bots, etc., are going to be looking for open port 22s out there on the internet. And you will see many attempted logins to your box in your logs if you keep it on port 22. Now, that's not necessarily a problem uh, because the chances are they won't get in anyway. Um, but if you want to limit the amount of attempts that are used to get into your box, you can change the port number. A lot of people seem to use 2222, but because a lot of people use that, the chances are that that's also going to get hit quite a lot um, with uh, automated bots seeing if that port is open. Personally, when I actually uh, used to have to access my box externally, I used to set uh, the port to something in the 50,000s, some obscure port, um, which certainly cut down on the amount of attempts there were to actually log into SSH to access my box. But you shouldn't do this without putting some sort of thought into it. I have um, a page open here. Uh, why putting SSH on another port than 22 is bad? Now, this is an article that's over two years old. Uh, I'll, I'll put the link to it, by the way, in the notes. But it was an interesting read, and it's not one that I've read before. And the author essentially says that, actually, the first 1,024 ports on your machine are privileged ports. They can only actually be opened up by root. The ports above that are non privileged ports and therefore technically if you put your ssh ad hd port above a thousand and twenty four you may actually be making the chances for an attacker to get in easier now <laughs> whether or not this is a uh, a real thing um, is up to you to read about. Uh, there were lots of people who disagree with this. Um, changing the port can certainly help to get less attacks on your box. Uh, does it minimize the chances of somebody getting in? Well, this, this guy seems to be suggesting yes. You are going to have to decide that for yourself. So, I'll put the link to this. It's an old one, and there's arguments back and forth, but it's certainly worth a read. So, let's go back now to uh, my SSHD config file. For the time being, and because I'm only using SSH internally, I'm just going to keep port 22 as uh, the port that I'm going to uh, listen to SSH on. So once you've considered whether or not you're going to change your SSHD port, the next thing to do now that you've set up your uh, key-based authentication is to disable password authentication. This reduces the chance of somebody getting into your box simply by guessing the password. So at the moment, you can see the default is sent, set to password authentication, yes. Um, and you can change that simply to no and uncomment it. Now, the other thing to consider is uh, stopping the possibility of root logins to your box. Well, if you've already set um, the password authentication to no, so that you can only log in with public and private keys, that's pretty much going to disable that anyway and you will see here that permit root login prohibit password what that essentially means and this is the default is that root logins 
can no longer take place password only or any sort of interacted, interactive login. They can only take place if the root user has a public private key uh, set up. Um, that's not generally the case. So, so far, so good. There are some additional things that you can do. For instance, um, you can, in fact, have a look at uh, Chris Titus's page. He's got an in in extremely useful uh, SSH guide, which talks about how you can enhance the security of SSH by doing such things as adding in options into your SSHD config to allow certain users or deny certain users. Uh, again, I'll put a link to that in, in the uh, information section of this video. Take a look, see what you think. Bottom line is, make sure that you are happy with the security of your SSH server before you open it up to the world. So, whatever changes you've made, and of course I've not made any actual changes here, but save the file once the changes have been made, and restart the SSHD daemon. And of course, I'm on a system D system, which still requires me to spell the thing correctly. And I'm just going to do sudo systemctl restart sshd. All good. So, with SSH, you can log in remotely to your systems. We've set up our dynamic DNS host. We've port forwarded the relevant ports in our router. We've set up um, a static IP address uh, in various ways, but whichever works for you on our workstation. We've configured our SSHD to make sure that SSH is secure as possible and we can now get into our box remotely using the command line. Now, you are not restricted to the command line, not by any stretch of the imagination. If you use SSH with the minus X option, you can actually open uh, a GUI uh, application within your workstation so let me just demonstrate this. Uh, we would go in as normal into my Arch laptop with the SSH command, but this time we would use a minus capital X. We don't need a password because we've got key-based authentication set up. But because we've gone in with the minus capital X option, I can now, theoretically anyway, this is the test, open up one of the GUI applications. And let's do something simple like the Mate Calculator or the Mate Calculator. And there you go. This is the Mate Calculator that exists on my Arch laptop, but which I have accessed remotely on my main workstation. Now, you can see that took a while to render properly and it might be useful this uh, facility if you just need to access a particular application quickly. Most of us though would prefer when we're remoting in not just to have the command line but to be able to get our full desktop up. So can we do this with SSH? Well yes we can but we use SSH as, I suppose you could call it a helper. And I'm going to demonstrate how I used to do this by shutting down, <coughs> excuse me, by shutting down my um, Arch laptop now, opening up another laptop, an X260, which I dual boot with Windows 10. What I'm going to do is I'm going to access Windows 10 via the 
RDP or remote desktop protocol, which tends to be quite fast. And I found it to be really useful, but I'm gonna use SSH to secure that. So uh, let's show how this works. The remote desktop protocol uh, uh, ships uh, as the native re remote desktop server with uh, Windows uh, is quite fast. Uh, it's easy to configure and it's quite insecure. Now, by that, I mean I would not open up port 3389, which remote desktop works on, uh, on my router and on my workstation. Nevertheless, just using port 3389 to connect to remote desktop is absolutely fine over uh, an internal network uh, where we're not talking about the outside getting in. Now, I use a little desktop application called Remina, which is pretty good, actually, for accessing RDP. You can see I'm on my Arch desktop, and I simply set the protocol RDP. I put in the server. I put in the username. I put in the user password. I set whatever I want to use in terms of a resolution, and I save it. In order to start my Windows 10 desktop remotely and to access it from my, uh, my uh, Arch workstation, I would simply double click the Windows 10 entry. And I actually made it full screen before. And here you have it. Arch Linux is now accessing my Windows 10 laptop uh, over the RDP protocol. Nice and fast, nice and easy to use. And if you have two computers, it almost makes you wonder why you'd need a virtual machine because you can just get any Windows work that you need to do over a remote desktop connection. So let's stop that. <clears throat> now, the problem is we do not want to access that over the internet. Port 3389 um, should not be open on your router. It is not as secure as SSH. And let's face it, the only way that we can be absolutely safe uh, in the knowledge that no one can access our uh, computers on an internal network is not to be connected to the internet at all. But... If we're going to poke holes in the router, just having one port for SSH to go through is a sensible option. So the way that we can do this, let me just clear this now. First of all, make sure that you have installed SSH or open SSH on Windows. Seriously? <laughs> you can now do that. We hear that uh, Microsoft loves Linux and you can now install OpenSSH on Windows. You can do it through uh, the graphical applications, just adding them as an additional service, or you can do them through PowerShell. Just do a Google search to find out how to install them. The OpenSSH server isn't installed by default but it's simplicity itself to get up and running. We used to, back in the day, have to default to using things like SigWin, uh, which is a little bit of Linux added to a Windows operating system. But now that OpenSSH is there by default, that's brilliant. In fact, if I just show you this, uh, oops, SSH, Two five one is my Windows box. I'm going to put in my password, and all of a sudden we are on Windows. I can hit the dir command, and there you go. Okay, so let me exit out of that. So it is more than possible now to have SSH running on Windows. 
But if I want to actually get to my uh, remote desktop server, I don't just want to access port 3389. I want to take advantage of something called SSH port forwarding, which essentially takes uh, a local port on your own machine and forwards it to port 3389. I can then access that port on the remote sheen machine on the local host port on my machine. I know I'm not explaining this very well, but let me try and see if I can uh, bring something up. So SSH, uh, when we're doing local port forwarding, creates an additional local port which you will forward to a port on the remote system. Then in your browser or application, you'll be able to access that application on localhost followed by that port. So let me show you what I mean. I was doing this earlier and I have created a local port forward command. <coughs> Excuse me. So, what I'm actually saying here, so 192.168.1.251 is the IP address of my Windows laptop. Remote desktop runs on port 3389. By specifying the minus capital L option, I'm asking SSH to do a local port forward. And I've picked a random port on my computer, uh, 1,000, well, sorry, 13,389. And I'm going to forward that port over to port 3389 on this machine and then access remote desktop on this port. So it's asking for my password. Great. So, how does this actually work in practice? Well, I've already set this up in Remina on a different entry, and let me show what I've done. I've changed only one line. Rather than putting in the IP address of my Windows 10 laptop, because I forwarded my local port, 13389, over SSH to the Windows laptop, I should now be able to access RDP on localhost 13389. Let's see if I can. And there we have it. I don't need to have port 3389 open, even in my Windows firewall. All I need to be able to access is SSH. I then create this port forward, this, if you like, SSH tunnel. And uh, it's a little bit like thinking of a VPN. I then access RDP through that SSH tunnel. What this means is that we can use RDP to access Windows. Um, but at the same time, we've secured it with SSH and it will now be as difficult to break into as SSH is. Now, I'm accessing RDP over a Windows box here, but you can equally do this over with VNC, for instance, if you prefer to use that. Uh, you can do it with any sort of uh, remote uh, desktop server. Um, you can also play around with local port forwarding. Let me just shut this down while I'm having a, a little bit of a chat. Um, yeah, you can also uh, play around with it. I used to have a Windows box set up uh, at my home with a DDWRT router plugged directly into it with the router configured to act as a wireless bridge. I used SSH local port forwarding to access the web GUI on the uh, DDWRT router in my local browser 
so that I could then work my way down to the section that allowed me to uh, hit a button in DDWRT to hit the wake on LAN facility or to send the magic the magic ping uh, through to my desktop and wake it up. I could then SSH into my desktop once I'd done that. I didn't like to keep my desktop running, so it was a great way to go into it. Okay, so this is the last part, really. Um, everybody hates typing loads of stuff, but there is a way to avoid it. And the way to avoid it is go into your uh, .ssh directory and create a file called config. Just touch config is, is absolutely fine. Um, if I show you what's in that file, you will see I have a number of what are called stanzas. First of all, I've got Win10. I've got the host name, which we know is 192.168.1.251, my username and the port number. I've then got a second stanza, Win10 SSH, with the same information as above, but I've put in the details for the local forward. Uh, port 13389 and over to 3389 on the Windows desktop to access the uh, RDP server. And then I've got my Arch laptop um, with OTB as the username. So let's take the Arch laptop to start off with. The traditional way of doing this is simply to go into SSH OTB at... 192.168.1.131. We've got key-based authentication set up, so it doesn't require me to actually insert a password. However, by having an entry in the config file, I've called that host Arch Laptop. All I actually need to type is SSH Arch Laptop, or whatever I wanted. And I'm in. Let's look at the Windows one. Um, if I can just remind myself of the uh, of the IP address, so I could go in as SSH Steve at uh, 192.168.1.251. I haven't set up key-based authentication in Windows. So it's asking me for my password. But if you look at the next entry, uh, or the middle entry there, Win10SSH, I've actually got the local forwarding set up. So the, what that means is I only have to type SSH, Win10SSH, asks me for my password. I'm in. Has it worked? Well, the best way to, is to bring up uh, Romina and try and access RDP on localhost 13389. And there you have it. So if, like me, you're particularly lazy, you can simply set up a configuration file in your .ssh directory. And there are lots of different options that you can put in here. It's similar to creating an alias, uh, but it allows you a bit more flexibility. For instance, if you're using multiple private keys for different things, you know, to access work, uh, a VPS, machines on your local network, you can actually put an entry in these stanzas that points to the particular private key that should be used for each host. Okay, that's all I really want to discuss today before I tie myself in knots, so let's have a chat. So there you have it, OpenSSH. Um, it's useful on a local network. It's incredibly useful when you're trying to access um, your machine from an external location and it's probably one of the most secure 
services that you can use if you're you're going to try and connect to machines uh, over the internet. Um, I know that I've covered quite a lot of ground on this, um, and I've not always gone into as much detail as I perhaps should have done. Um, I was very much aware that I wanted to keep this to a reasonable size. The one thing I would say is please... If you're going to follow some of the uh, ideas that I've presented today, follow it up with a little bit of research as well, uh, because SSH is um, it can do all sorts of things. And in terms of the security side of it, do a little bit of reading before you poke holes in your firewall. But anyway, that's it for today. And uh, I'll speak to you again next week. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please like and subscribe. It really helps. And stay well until next time.